Good evening, friends and colleagues. Welcome to Assessing Systemic Racism in Dentistry and Building the Right Treatment Plan, a call to action. It is such an honor to be here with you to serve as your moderator for tonight's webinar. By the way of introduction, my name is Dr. Layla Hyshaw. I am a board certified pediatric dentist practicing here in Tucson, Arizona, and I am the proud founder of Diversity in Dentistry Mentorships, a nonprofit organization on a mission to mentor young people of historically underrepresented groups to go into dentistry and to strike a more balance in our profession. As a member of the current class of the ADA Institute of Diversity and Leadership, I have been given the priceless opportunity to enhance my leadership experience and professional network to expand upon my passion projects, those that are positively impacting our beloved field of dentistry. For me, bringing awareness of the inequities that exist for our patients of color and amplifying the voices of our dentists of color, our minority dentists, to share their issues that are impacting them and to, to, to really help them get their voices heard and seen and respected. And this webinar is one such project. It's more than a project though, it's the right thing to do. Your attendance tonight and courage to listen and willingness to learn will surely spark an actual change and solutions that are truly needed for all dentists to be seen. We are in the moment of global mobilization toward racial equity and inclusion. To achieve this noble goal, pillars in our communities are striving to better identify and confront systemic racism, which has woven its way into dentistry as well. The national calls of action um, have inspired us to have conversations like the one we'll have tonight and to force us to think about how we can live up to the ideals to which we aspire. Today's goal is to lay a foundation, to understand the historical context and current perspectives of racism through the lens of a dentist. We should learn from our medical colleagues. You know, they are addressing racism and how it's impacting not only dental education, but dental research, the delivery of oral health care, and ultimately the diversity of their health profession. We must appreciate the experience of dentists, staffs, staff, patients, and underrepresented, of underrepresented minority groups. Keeping in mind that all racial minorities may experience some level of discrimination and racism, it often presents in different ways. And we have a distinct panel of leaders that can offer us these different perspectives. In order to dismantle racism in dentistry, we must face our fears, lean into our discomfort, and challenge ourselves to have courageous and vulnerable conversations. Well, I am so excited because tonight is gonna to be a wonderful evening. We are going to hear so many stories. We're gonna learn a lot, but we're also gonna have a conversation. This is not a lecture. So we do invite you to go ahead and let me explain how you can engage into our programming this evening. On our next slide, if you have questions, it will show you where to put your questions for the technical team in the chat. But if you have a question for any of our presenters or our panelists, you will put them in the Q&A box because there will be a time at the end of the session to ask questions of any of our presenters and our panelists. But let's talk about our wonderful presenters and panelists. I'm excited to introduce to them, them to you. I first must acknowledge the Diversity Summit Presidents Group who is co-sponsoring this event for me and for us. <laughs> and um, let me give you a little background. This is comprised of presidents of the diverse groups such as our American Dental Association, Hispanic Dental Association, National Dental Association, and the Society of American Dentists. This was set in motion in 2010 under the leadership of Dr. Gist, who was the eight, first African-American president of the American Dental Association. And it set in motion a new and more constructive, constructive relationship among them. Um, of the outcome, we have, they have continued to meet, to have um, dialogue through periodic conference calls and an annual leadership development program. In 2013, the American Association of Women Dentists officially became of the collaborative group and the Korean American Dental Association joined just last year. So we will hear from each of the presidents of their uh, respective organizations. Next. 
our presenters this evening are going to just blow you away. <laughs> I will tell you a little bit in just the next few slides of how we came together. But first, let me introduce you to uh, Drs. Jaha Howard and my colleague, Dr. Colleague, Dr. Karen Eswick, both diplomats of the American Board of Pediatric Dentistry. Dr. Howard uh, received his dental degree at Howard University. Um, he is a practice owner of pediatric dentistry and um, at A plus pediatric dentistry in Atlanta, Georgia. And his bio, if I can just read it to you, and, um, and there's just so much more that we would love to share, but we will keep them brief so we can get to the nitty gritty. But love God, love God and love people is Dr. Jaha Howard's motto. As a board certified pediatric dentist and owner of A-plus Pediatric Dentistry of Atlanta, he works with families of all backgrounds to achieve excellent oral health. Dr. Howard earned both his BS and DDS at Howard University. He later earned his pediatric dentistry certificate and master's in oral sciences at UIC in Chicago in 2009. Dr. Howard then moved back to his hometown in Georgia where he has worked collaboratively with solution-oriented parents, educators, and policymakers to help address some of the biggest challenges present in his community. His dental and public education work has been featured on several media outlets and print publications. He currently serves as Cobb County School Board member in the second largest school district in Georgia, co-founded Families Against Racism a nonprofit organization that creates space for families to learn and work against systemic racism in the United States. Dr. Eswick is a board certified pediatric dentist as well, private practitioner and fellow of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. Her area of focus is dental missions around the world. She gained both her dental degree and pediatric dentistry training at Columbia University, New York Presbyterian Hospital. And I can attest that both of them have been so generous with their time and their knowledge and really are passionate about making a greater difference and impact on not only the, the specialty of pediatric dentistry, but in our whole profession. Next slide. Let's get into the president's panelists here. I will be introducing the presidents in alphabetical order of their organization. So I'm pleased to bring to you Dr. Daphne Ferguson-Young. She's a president of the American Association of Women Dentists, and she is a professor in the Division of Surgical Sciences at Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee, where she has been a faculty member for 15 years. Currently, she is the director of the GPR program and participates on several college committees and served in numerous leadership capacities. Prior to her academic appointment, Dr. Ferguson Young maintained a private practice in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and practiced as a staff dentist at Matthew Walker Community Health Center. She received her bachelor's degree at NCANT State University and her doc a dental doctorate degree and master's of public health degrees at Meharry Medical College. Dr. Ferguson Young completed the IDEA Leadership Institute as a scholarship fellow and holds a fellowship in the American College of Dentists. Next, Dr. Cesar Sabates, president-elect of the American Dental Association. He previously served as a 17th district trustee for the ADA Board of Trustees from 2016 to 2020, and as a delegate at the ADA House of Delegates from 2000 to 2016. He is also past president of the Florida Dental Association, South Florida District Dental Association as well. Dr. Sabates received his dental degree from my alma mater, UMKC School of Dentistry in Kansas City, Missouri. He is a member of the Academy of General Dentistry, Hispanic Dental Association, American College of Dentists, International College of Dentists, and the Pierre Fichard Academy. And I bring you the president of the Hispanic Dental Association, Dr. Rosa Shaviano Moran. She, is, uh, she has graduated from Rutgers School of Dental Medicine and is Associate Dean for Admissions and serves as faculty, recruiter, advocate, and mentor, encouraging and supporting prospective and current students to Rutgers. She is a principal investigator for the Adia Guys Foundation grant and co-PI and dental director of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Summer Health Professions Educational Program and all RSDM educational pipeline programs promoting dentistry and achievement for all students. 
She has been recognized with the Chair of IDEA Board Citation and the Rutgers University Leaders in Faculty Diversity Award for her national leadership roles in holistic admissions process and advocacy for student diversity. She is a member of uh, the ADA, a fellow of the International College of Dentists, IDEA Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee, and Chair of IDEA Straight, Gay Straight Alliance, and much, much more. On to our next slide, I'll introduce you to Dr. David H. Kim, the president of the Korean American Dental Association. He obtained his dental degree from Columbia University School of Dental and Oral Surgery with an area of concentration in oral maxillofacial surgery. Then he obtained his MD from Medical College of Pennsylvania Hanneman University School of Medicine in Philadelphia. Dr. Kim spent two years as general surgery resident and completed his oral and maxillofacial surgery residency at Drexel University <clears throat> College of Medicine and furthered his training in facial surgery and medical aesthetics from Florida's Aesthetic, Aesthetic Skin Institute. Currently, Dr. Kim is an attending surgeon at Long Beach Memorial Medical Center and Miller Children's Hospital and is duly certified by the American Board of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery and Board of Aesthetic Medicine. He practices a full scope of oral maxillofacial surgery and aesthetic medicine in Long Beach and in Los Angeles. Dr. Pamela Austin, the president of the National Dental Association. She is the dental director at the Eastmont Wellness Center in Oakland and has been providing dental services to the underserved and disadvantaged communities of Alameda County and beyond since 1983. Dr. Austin's experience includes more than 10 years of providing dental care at Santa Rita and North County jails and more than 20 years at the Central Health Center in Oakland. Throughout her career, she has been a consistent advocate and provider of excellent care for vulnerable populations. She is also a spirited volunteer who participates in oral health education programs for high-risk youth and in mentorship programs to inspire Oakland youth to pursue health careers. And last but not least, Dr. Felicia Font, uh, sorry, Font, no, is the president of the Society of American Indian Dentists. She is of the Mescalero Apache tribe and is a newly elected president of Society of American Indian Dentists. She previously, see, excuse me, she previously served for five years on the said board as a member at large and secretary. Dr. Fontenot recently returned home to her community at Mescalero Apache Reservation to serve as dental director of the Mescalero Service Unit and Indian Health Services Facility. She first left uh, to her home to attend college at Stanford University, earning her bachelor's degree in human biology, then her master's in health science at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where she learned the significance of oral health impacts on oral overall health. Dr. Fontenot attended the University of the Pacific Author Dugan, uh, sorry, Dujani School of Dentistry in San Francisco, California, where she graduated as the first Mescalero Apache dentist. Dr. Fontenot's long-term vision includes applying her public health skills to reduce the high burden of oral health disease among Native populations and to increase access to restorative dental services. She commits to mentoring other Native Americans interested in oral health careers and hopes at her lifetime to witness us other Mescalero Apache tribal members become, de become dentists to provide high quality care for their people. Well, that is quite a distinguished panel if I don't, if I do say so myself. So how do we get here? Let's get into it. I'm so, so excited. Um, last year, Dr. Howard, uh, posted this this comment here, this question in a popular I, um, Facebook group, the Collaborative Pediatric Dentist. Do you think we'll ever discuss systemic racism and the practice of pediatric dentistry at an AAPD event? Well, by the outpouring of comments and, and reactions, I knew in my heart that we could. After the murder of George Floyd, I knew that we had to. And from them, we did. And you'll see in the next slide that we had a stage on the national stage for our academy. And we were graced by 
uh, trailblazers in um, dentistry from Dr. Jean Sinkford to educators, corporate uh, industry professionals, and, and leaders of Black dentists and uh, to talk about this important conversation. From there, it has been evolved to realize perhaps this conversation can, can reach a broader stage and discuss how it's impacting all of us in dentistry, not just pediatric dentistry. So around the same time, we presented this in May and I had just submitted my article or op-ed piece in the ADA news that you'll see in the next slide. Um, when I shared my, uh, my, my viewpoint about why diversity in dentistry matters and, and how you can help. And I was so humbled and grateful to our, uh, our standing president, Dr. Daniel Clinison, who invited me to write this op-ed piece. It would allow the platform to discuss um, not only the st staggering st statistics, of the lack of diversity, especially Black dentists in our dental workforce, but also to give a ways of to uh, sharing how others could to get involved and how we need to strengthen and lengthen that pipeline earlier into the youth so that we can then get these kids on the right track, increase the applicant pools of uh, ac applicant pool to dental school of qualified, competent, competitive. Uh, applicants, so then we could increase diversity in dentistry. Well, I was really excited about it, but I didn't really think about how it might be received. And unfortunately, I was faced with some hurtful, hurtful statements um, rooted in, in racist bias about questioning my right to speak on diversity. And everyone, not I mean, there are so many who have similar st stories of how microaggressions and biases have hurt them, not only in their educational pursuits in dentistry, but in private practice and research and in education. And this is why I felt it was important to have this conversation. I was very, very grateful to be able to turn to my organizations in the next slide um, from both the American Dental Association and my home organization of the National Dental Association. And it brought to light to a broader audience about how colleagues, there are still some <laughs> that will, um, will be there to try to tear you down, to make you small and make you question your right to, to fight, to speak for diversity, to, to be a dentist, to hold this space. And it's time that we have this discussion so that we can be not only better providers for our patients of color, but better colleagues to our dentists that are working alongside us to improve the oral health of the public. So I wanted to take just a moment to thank both Dr. Pamela Austin and Dr. Daniel Clemenson for speaking up and finding the courage to do that publicly. So now it is time that we get into our presentations. So I will ask Dr. Howard to come on and he will take us through just to kind of give you an overview of what will happen this evening because we got a lot to go through. In 15 minutes, he's going to try to provide historical yeah, no context, right? Um, no, racism. no problem. We're going to like go over systemic racism. 15 minutes, you'll have it down. Fantastic. Perfect. So well, no, great. no challenge at all here. So thank you so much for introducing everybody. That's such a tough job to introduce everyone and open us, open everything up. If you're in the chat and you can hear us, we would love for y'all to let us know where you're viewing from. Uh, we we love to kind of know who's out there. Um, yeah, and, you and would be before you start in, just to well. kind of gauge the temperature of yeah. where everyone is, we do have a quick little Ooh, poll. Let's do that. Let's do the poll. Let's do before the poll. <laughs> All right, so that's gonna come up. We're gonna have a quick poll. We'll have a poll, his presentation. And so if you could just answer this question. Systemic racism is a barrier to entry to dentistry. Agree? Some would agree, some would disagree, disagree. So let us see where we, what you're thinking. Good, good, good. So, so far, Dr. Howard, I see we're around High 70s of agree, maybe 20% somewhat agree, 2% somewhat disagree, and I think just 1% disagree. 
All right. Thank you for participating. Excellent. Yes, and, and we appreciate y'all we'll joining in on this polls. Uh, we want to make sure we're being very, you know, transparent, and we want to know who we're talking to. Uh, we're, just, we're not here to make sure we're all in agreement with everything that we're going to say, but we want to have a brave and courageous conversation. So uh, I'm Dr. Jaha Howard. Happy to be here with you. Let's go to the next slide. That's my team. That's my boo. And so in other pictures to see my family. So we had we celebrated 10 year anniversary for our office and uh, right outside Atlanta, Georgia and Smyrna area. So Atlanta, Smyrna area and I turned 40. So that's exciting. So a uh, big Hawks fan and we were able to hang out, celebrate. This is when we caught a moment of non like COVID was at a really low point and we were we were in good shape. We could actually go outside and hang, hang out and then, you know, things got crazy again with Delta variant. So next slide. All right, so what's about to happen? We are gonna take a short survey together. We're gonna to talk about race in our country. Uh, we may get into some uncomfortable territory, but we're gonna be better dentists and better neighbors. That's our goal, better dentists and better neighbors. Next slide. Why and how are we doing this? So at the end of the day, relationship and trust are foundational. We want to embrace relationship and trust. Also, it's important to understand context and nuance. Uh, let them be our tour guides as we navigate this experience. Let's appreciate context and nuance. And I gotta tell you something, ideas can be extremely powerful, extremely powerful, be careful with those ideas. Uh, on those pictures, you're seeing an idea of families saying, you know what, we're going to create a space to uh, protest uh, racial discrimination in a family friendly way. And it was an idea and it was powerful. And we ended up having an amazing uh, a protest with over a thousand parents out uh, in the Atlanta area. So uh, this is the work that we do, but also what is all this race stuff about in the first place? Let's keep going, next slide. Let's define some terms. First, uh, we're gonna talk, talk about race, racism, and systemic. Uh, 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 Webster's Dictionary says race is any one of the groups that humans are often divided into based on physical traits regarded as common among people of shared ancestry. Physical traits regarded as common among people of shared ancestry. And there's a great quote from the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Race is a human invented shorthand term used to describe and categorize people into various social groups based on characteristics like skin color, physical features, genetic um, heredity. And it goes on from there. Let's, uh, next slide. Racism. A belief that race is fundamentally, uh, is, excuse me, is a fundamental determinant of human trait and capacities, and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. That's a key phrase right there. It produces, that race produces an inherent superiority of a particular race. All right. Also related to systemic oppression, we see that there, and the famous uh, uh, Howard University, co also Howard University, uh, a former student, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates said, race is the child of racism, not the father. I want y'all to think about that. Race is the child of racism, not the father. You would think you get race first, then you get racism, but if race is man-made and just produced by people, that means that we were dealing with this idea of separation based on this thing and we created race to justify a racism. So next slide. And when we use the word systemic, we're talking about something that's affecting a body in general, uh, something that's fundamental to a predominant social, economic, or political practice. Uh, when we talk about a systemic disease, we know that talks about our whole entire body. And we're talking about systems in, say, the United States, if we're talking about our country, systemic racism, we're talking about woven, racism woven into different aspects of our society. And we'll talk about that. Uh, Isabel Wilkerson, one of my favorite, uh, favorite authors said in her book cast, a caste system is an artificial construction, a fixed and embedded ranking of human value 
that is set the that set the pre uh, excuse me that sets the presumed supremacy of one group against the presumed inferiority of other groups. So when we talk about racism, I want you to also hear in the shadows caste system. Race and racism is just an expression of caste. It, it's an expression of separating groups all underneath this idea that we have some groups that are in inherently better, superior, and some groups that are inherently inferior. A lot of people think racism is about hate. And I hope that when you leave here today, you will leave knowing that racism is not about hate. It's about superiority based on a made up category, in this case, racism. All right, next. All right, uh, a fruit tree. If we look at a tree, I was in uh, Dr. Heischel's uh, territory here in Arizona when I took this picture. Uh, we don't have trees like this in Georgia. We, yeah, we do, we have some figs. But when you look at the fruit of a tree, you, you gotta appreciate the nuance. You gotta appreciate the weather. You gotta appreciate what the, 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 the leaves of the tree appreciate, not just the fruit, but the branches, appreciate the roots, appreciate the fact that this, the soil that this and the dirt that this tree is in, appreciate the history uh, what's been grown in this air in this area all of that matters if anybody has spent any time outside and understands the, the ecosystem context matters context matters the system matters and we will look at the fruit but sometimes we get so caught up in oh this person said the n-word oh this person said a racial slur oh this per and, and again that's terrible but there's something underneath it and we got to get to the root of the problem pun intended for us dentists Next. All right, seeds of racism. Y'all, we can go back thousands of years, but I mean, we can even just pull out famous philosophers like Aristotle. Aristotle believed in uh, this idea of cultural superiority of, uh, of the Greek people at the time and that there's a natural order. Uh, you had uh, just fast forward into the 1400s when Portugal was trailblazing the idea of of uh, exploring and conquering different parts of the world when the European conquest of, of the globe was really starting to kick off. Uh, this account of Prince Henry's uh, uh, of travel really helped people to see this idea of others. There's, there's us and then there's others. And anytime you can create an other, it justifies doing whatever you need to do to the other for mm. your own benefit. And this is why race is always connected to capitalism, money, that kind of thing. I won't even say capitalism, just money, economics. So all of that's connected. And then I want to fast forward into the 1600s where the enlightenment came in and, and really took our country by storm. And we have uh, amazing, brilliant men uh, and women who were captivated by this idea of something amazing was happening, something inherent was, um, it was happening uh, with the people of the world, but not all the people of the world, just certain people of the world. And so you have this very interesting roots developing, this idea of two things, natural uh, superiority and this idea that we had divine superiority. So let's take a look at that. Next slide. All right, so one way that I thought might be good to go and do a survey of systemic racism is just look at our, our university systems, how we break down our country. We break it down into branches and systems. So just look at the studies of the humanities and social sciences. And I want y'all to, you know, follow the logic here. I mean, if you just look at something like geography, if there is a powerful idea, remember we said, be careful with ideas. If there's an idea that, hmm, we group of people are more superior than anybody who's an other, let's deem them subhuman. Let's deem them savages, even though we came upon their land. We are going to now drive out a property for ourselves and claim it as our own. What would make somebody think that it's okay to do that? Oftentimes, God-fearing people and so-called moral people did this. Why? It's because this idea that my group is superior, this other group is inferior, and dare we say subhuman. This carried on in so many different ways. I mean, 
we talk, we you hear a lot about the wall and built the wall. I mean, this is a cartoon from the 1870s about building a wall around the United States of America. People were afraid of the Chinese immigrants that were literally building a lot of the infrastructure on the in the West Coast, which is now the United States. Interesting, right? But if you look at the list of topics there, history, language, philosophy, religion, racism, the idea of a group as being superior than another group weaves its way into every aspect of it. And that legacy continues to have a generation after generation continue from here. Next slide. All right, more branches. You're probably thinking there's no way there's any issues when it comes to agriculture. We'll just ask the Black farmers over the last three or four decades about racial discrimination and not getting its due in land that was taken from them. Uh, what about journalism? No, 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 no. We, of course, we have racism in journalism because we're talking about stories being told from a point of view. But what happens when that point of view is always from the a conqueror's point of view. What about those that were conquered? And when you have a society and a whole country that really took off in the world stage, how in the world did we get so powerful? Well, you need money. Well, how do you get money? Well, you have to exploit large groups of people. And so we know that slavery was instrumental in making sure that we had a huge amount of capital to fund businesses, not just in the South, but in the North, uh, fuel the military power that you even see today. It all started from that old money from exploiting large groups of enslaved human beings. All right. And next. And you're probably thinking, good, good thing we have technology because we don't have to worry about systemic racism and technology. Well, tell me why we even at the bed of even at the this idea of, of AI, artificial intelligence, when we're trying to teach a computer what's good and what's bad, guess what we do? We feed the computer information pre-existing information about good and bad. This is why we have some companies where when you have a, a black gentleman and they're doing a facial recognition, they're now saying, would you also like to see more gorillas? That has happened. This is the kind of thing that has happened multiple times because racism and bias is embedded in every aspect of our lives, including to the latest technology. But here we are in the sciences, but how come we only hear about the things that were developed from European, from a European lens? What about all those from different Eastern uh, nations and ethnicities where developing all kind of incredible uh, medicines, but we don't hear that. It's not taught. It didn't make it to the canon of our books. Um, but you know what? We always have good old fashioned biology. Well, then you get genetics, then you get race science, then you have you, you genetics, good genes that takes off. And now this gets into the idea of a superior race based on genetic makeup that was sweeping through our country and in Europe over the, in the uh, early 1900s. And best believe some of those same scholars and the, and the disciples of those same scholars are still around right now. We have a legacy a deep, deep, deep legacy of racism. It's almost <laughs> like greed. Makes its way into every single aspect of our lives. Unfortunately, so does uh, racism. Next slide. So uh, I like, I'll just pull one of these quotes. Uh, the last quote that uh, Isabel Wilkerson says is, many people may rightly say, I had nothing to do with how this all started. I have nothing to do with the, the sins of the past. My ancestors never attacked indigenous people, never owned slaved and slaves. And yes, uh, no, uh, excuse me, not one of us was here when this house was built. Our immediate ancestors may have nothing, had nothing to do with it, but here we are, the current occupants of the property with stress cracks and bowed walls and fissures built into the foundation. We are heirs to whatever is right or wrong with it. We did not erect the uneven pillars of Joyce, but they are ours to deal with now. Next slide. For your consideration, Context and nuance play a vital role when we're trying to build relationship and trust. We, it's okay to say that our founding fathers in the United States were brilliant men, but it's also okay to point out the fact that they had some horrible ideas as well as brilliant ideas. Some of them were talking about uh, 
uh, humanity and rights for everybody. At the same time, they were enslaved human beings that they were uh, forcing themselves to sleep with and having children by enslaved human beings. These are happening with our founding fathers. We have to be careful. We have to appreciate nuance. We can say, we can acknowledge the greatness of a thing, but also uh, critique the challenges and the problems, just like we do with business, just like we do with our favorite sports teams. Next one, the scope of our solutions must be as foundational, I'm sorry, back um, the scope of our solutions must be as uh, fundamental and far reaching as the scope of the problem. Y'all, I tried to at least paint a quick picture that our problem is deep and is widespread. So it would be foolish for the, us to think that the solutions come from a little checkbox here and a little here and a little there. The scope of our solutions have to be just as far reaching, just as fundamental, just as foundational as the problem. We need our time, talent, and treasures to really dig in and make this work. When passive and active collide, active usually wins. So there are many of you that may say, you know what? That's too much going on. I'm not going to get involved. That's a passive stance. It's going to take active anti-racism to battle against racism that has already been going. That train has left the station and we have to derail it and stop it at its tracks. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate y'all. And those are my kids uh, participating in a, another one of our Families Against Racism uh, 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 events. And again, thank you. I hope I didn't take too much time, but I wanted to briefly go through and just make the, make the point that we have to get to the root of the problem and the scope of our solutions. When we start talking about solutions, we have to appreciate the depth of the problem. We understand this with our patients. We have to do that with our social issues of the day. Thanks. Absolutely. And those are some of the cutest activists I've seen ever. <laughs> thank you so much, as always. Mm -hmm. Such a wealth of information. Um, and, and the way you deliver it, uh, it's something that I think everyone can hold on to and, and really think about it, just the nuance and the context. So we have a, another quick poll, and we will get the results up um, this time. So let's go ahead and present this. Exploring biases may be uncomfortable, but I am here to listen and learn to be a better colleague and provider for my patients of color. And here you can answer, absolutely, I have a lot to learn. Finally, this conversation is overdue. And I dis disagree with the statement. Currently, I think we have about 140 plus on the call. And so we can see the final answer. And that number may have changed, I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and in the poll. All right, so about half and half, absolutely. And, and, and well, finally, absolutely a lot to learn and finally it's overdue and no one disagreed. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Okay, up next, we are gonna learn about the collar technique. What is that all about, Dr. Eswick? I'm gonna turn it over to you to build the right treatment plan. Okay, Lila, thank you so much for such a wonderful introduction. And I also wanted to say thank you to Jaha for the lovely foundation that he set for us. Now, systemic racism, uh, next slide, please. Systemic racism is woven into the fabric of our society. Its impact can be felt in pediatric dentistry. And my very first slide, I have to give a shout out to my precious little yum yums from my practice. Without them, I couldn't be here today. So thank you very much. Next slide, please. With an increase in the diversity of the US population, this issue warrants immediate attention since it affects our most vulnerable population children and general dentistry as well. Next slide, please. For the sake of clarity, underrepresented in healthcare is defined as practitioners who are Black, Hispanic, Latino, Alaskan Native, and Native American. Next slide, please. What do the numbers show? According to the American Dental Association Health Policy Institute, 3.8% of dentists in the US are Black. I want you guys to let that sink in for a moment, please. Next slide. 
The significance of these numbers is twofold. Patients tend to seek providers who look like them. According to Mertz, Calvin, and his colleagues, minority patients are more likely to seek care from provider of a similar race, and this increases health outcomes. This phenomenon is defined as racial concordance. So I wanted to take a moment to speak about racial concordance a little bit more. In a systematic review that was done by Shen, Peterson, and Byland, the effects of racial concordance on patient and physician communication, a systematic review of literature, they found that there was a decrease in communication quality, information given, patient participation, and the patient's ability to participate in decision-making. And I think that is really profound. When patients seek care, the provider will most likely not be from one of the underrepresented groups. Next slide, please. So how do we go about addressing the issue at hand? The patient presents to your office, now what? Let's have a conversation, not a lecture about this. Change and progress happen when we have open and honest discussions Let's honor each other's truths and be willing to be uncomfortable in order to develop an ideal treatment plan. Next slide, please. Diagnosing and treatment planning. To diagnose and treat the issues, I will use the format taught by Dr. Shantanu Lal in dental school. Thank you, Dr. Lal. So we need to have a diagnosis history, treatment, prescriptions, behavior, and what we plan to do at the next visit. In this case, what are we gonna do with all of the information that we have gathered from this webinar and lots of research? My diagnosis is that with the lack of pediatric, next slide please, Leila. With the lack of pediatric dentists from underrepresented groups, patients and children, are most likely to be treated by practitioners who do not share their background. As a result, there is a need for cultural competence, trust and relationship building between practitioners and patients from minority groups. Next slide. Next slide, please. Again, Jaha has given a thorough history of the origin of systemic racism and how we have arrived where we are today. Next slide, please. So in my own pediatric dental practice, I see patients from various backgrounds and regardless of the background of my patient, I treat them all with love and understanding because at the end of the day, we are all humans and we need to be valued. I happen to come up with a simple principle that I use when I'm treating my patients and I call it the collar principle. What is the collar principle? I had a purple moment. Purple is my favorite color. And realized that my interaction with people from diverse backgrounds involves what I call the collar principle. This principle can be used to become more culturally competent and aware. Please note that the expectation is not that you will be knowledgeable about every possible ethnicity that presents to your office. The principle, the principle will, however, set you on the path to become more competent. Oh, they can't see me, Lela? So collar, C is connect with the patient and family. O is being open to learning, even when it challenges your belief system. L, listen to understand, not to respond and pass judgment. The second L, let go of preconceived notions and bias. A is for authenticity. 
and R is to respect differences. How do you connect with the patients when you don't have similar backgrounds? So I have a couple of what I call K-isms. K-ism number one, we all have something in common. We just have to figure out what that is. So my first case study is what I call the organ protein shake story. So I had a new family in the practice and it was a very busy day. So I happened to have a protein shake, an organ protein shake. And one of the moms came to my workstation and she saw the protein shake and she looked at me and she looked at the protein shake and she said, Dr. Karen, whose shake is that? And I said, mine. And she was like, oh, this is like one of my favorite shakes. And something as simple as having a protein shake that we like in common helped us to develop a conversation and open the doors to having a, a good communication relationship. K is the number two. Without connection, there is no trust. Without trust, there is no relationship building. Without relationship and trust, there isn't case acceptance. I think sometimes as dentists, we get so focused on the perfect class two prep and our lovely IMAX crowns that you general dentists do. And we forget that there's an actual person connected to that dentition. Bear in mind that generally speaking, members of some underrepresented groups are distrustful of the healthcare system based on the experiences that they have had in the past. So it is our job to connect with them and make them feel safe in our environments. Next slide, please. Open to learning. Growth occurs when we are open to learning about others. Sometimes this can lead to a minor major disruption in our belief systems. People, generally speaking, love to see you make an effort to learn about them. If we don't learn, we become stagnant. I'll give you an example. In my own practice, I make a point of learning a little song in every language that is represented in my office. If it's Spanish, I sing La Cucuracha. If they are of the Jewish faith, Hevenu um, Shanu Alehem. If they're French, it's Fera Jaka. Russian, I'm still working on. So if anyone knows a cute little Russian song, let me know. But by learning about people, it makes them more comfortable and they see that we're actually making an effort to learn about them. Listening is a very important skill. It is mind blowing how much we can learn from our patients when we actively listen and observe nonverbal cues. Active listening can help us unearth clues that can help us with treatment planning and diagnosing. The goal is to listen to understand, not to respond and get our two cents in. The top plate story. So when I was at Columbia, I think it was second year, I had to do an externship in Brooklyn. And this uncle came to Downstate Hospital and he was telling one of the attendants that something was wrong with his top plate. And the attendant was a little bit confused. And here I was a little second year from Columbia who dared to intervene because I understood what the uncle was talking about. In a lot of cultures from the Caribbean, a top plate refers to a denture. So by listening to the uncle, I was able to help and there was a successful outcome. Sometimes all we have to do is listen to understand where our patients are coming from. The second case study is my multifamily apartment story. When I was in residency at Columbia, there was a young mommy who came in and the child had severe early childhood caries. And while we were busy having a conversation about nutritional counseling and the whole um, process of how cavities are formed, the mom told me a very interesting story. You see, there were multiple families living in that apartment 
and the dad had to get up really early in the morning to go to work. And it was very important to her that the child did not disrupt the father. And she did the best that she could by giving the kid juice in the bottle. And this contributed to the child having early childhood carries. So by listening, I was able to make some recommendations in terms of how she could help this child. Sometimes all we have to do is listen because our, parent, our parents and patients want to be heard. And this is how we can start on the road to building trust and relationships with our patients from diverse backgrounds. Let's go ahead and let go of preconceived notions and biases. If we are being honest with ourselves, all of us have biases and worldviews that color our interactions with, with and treatment of patients. We all, myself included, have work to do in this area. I constantly remind myself that the person presented to my practice is a unique person. K is the number three. Treat the patient, not the stereotype. I'm going to repeat that. Treat the patient, not the stereotype. So I'm going to give you my Manuel story. Manuel was one of my absolute favorite patients in dental school. So Manuel came in and he was missing number eight and nine. And he worked at the supermarket in a certain state that we're not going to talk about. Now, if I had relied on preconceived notions about Manuel, I would have said, you know what? Manuel cannot afford these implants. You know, he's from a certain background. He has a certain occupation. But I did not treat the stereotype. I treated the patient. And Manuel and I had an open and honest discussion. And you know what? He consented to having his implants done and he and his new girlfriend were very happy with the results. The most important part of the collar principle for me is being authentic. I'm sorry, authenticity. Be you and be sincere. So I'm gonna say this really quickly because it seems that I'm running, um, I'm taking up a little bit too much time. So I'm just gonna say it really quickly. You have to be authentic. Nothing leads to more distrust than when the patient does not believe that you are being authentic or coming from a good place. Authenticity guides you to the path to trust. Respect differences. People want to be accepted. Different does not equate wrong. So I thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I will be more than happy to answer. Leila? Thank you so much, Karen, Dr. S. You're that welcome. You know, after you presented this before, people were asking like, is this trademark? Because can I use it? Can I teach it to my students? And we're glad to hear that we have a lot of students on today that are really learning mm -hmm. from um, there, there are a couple questions, and if if I may ask that we will sure. address the questions after the panel discussion, so we can mm -hmm. dive in. So much information, we don't want to uh, step on on the time of our our presidents. So we see the questions. Thank you so much for engaging with us and being present. So let us now ask our presidents to all come on video, and let's get everyone up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Let me get the screen off there. And then if I could ask ADA to pin, we are gonna go in alphabetical order by president. So we could pin Dr. Alston and myself. And we then I know there was a comment that was hard to see the speakers. So let's see if we can do that, Susie. Let's see. Or gallery view. Let's get the gallery view. All right, awesome. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. All right, Dr. Alston, welcome, welcome, welcome. You are the president of an organization that has been a national forum and advocate for minority dentists like me. For over a hundred years, NDA has been the leader uh, in advancing the rights of its members and has a historic role in bringing diversity and equity to the forefront of discussions in, in many arenas, uh, bringing, uh, especially in, the, in dental education, in the practice of dentistry and society at large. 
So on behalf of all your members, I want to say thank you. And I also a sincere thank you for just really holding my hand. There are many times that we were on the call <laughs> after the, the letter came out. But um, because of it, uh, I have grown a close relationship with you. And for that, I'm truly blessed. Um, but let's talk about how um, you have advanced through the ranks of leadership in many other dental organizations besides just the National Dental Association and where these organizations have had a historic lack of diversity. So I'm, I know that, you know, we know acts of racism are not always blatant. There can be, um, you know, just, you know, I think the audacity of racism is sometimes it doesn't even see itself. So I ask if there have been as subtle as microaggressions in your progression through the leadership ranks. Can you share some of your personal stories of um, how you've experienced microaggressions if you have in your career and how allies really can and, and why they should stand up if they witness it? Thank you, Dr. Hisha. I'm happy to be on this panel and um, yes, I will answer your question. Um, you know, nowadays we are witnessing a flurry of organizations focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in one of the organizations on which uh, board I serve, I was given an opportunity to chair the board. The opportunity came after 13 years of serving on the board. My terms expired several times, but the board kept me on. I was the first black person on the board and for, the, for most of my term, the only black person who ever served in this 39 year old um, organization's history. And I was excited to chair the board. I had lots of plans. I anticipated a good working relationship with the secretary treasurer, whom I will call Mike. He joined the board after me and we had always had um, you know, good exchanges. Um, but it changed after he was installed as secretary treasurer and I was installed as chairperson. Shortly after our installation, I called Mike with the intention to discuss the agenda for what would be my first board meeting as chair. He was rude to me. He told me he was not going to work with me. I was deflated. I fully expected that Mike and I would work together, you know, as a team, uh, like the other previous secretary treasurers worked with, you know, their chairpersons. So I asked him why. He said, because he didn't want to work with me. I didn't know what to do at first. Uh, there is no executive director, the chairperson and the secretary treasurer have to work closely together. I needed the support from someone who would make Mike work with me. So I approached the vice chairman, whom I will call Al. Al had experience serving as secretary treasurer with several chairpersons. Al was someone easy to talk to, but most importantly, he was white, like Mike, and they were friends. And I knew Al would stick up for me. Al, in case you guessed it, is not his real name. Al is short for ally. And Mike is not his real name. It is short for microaggressor. Mm. Microaggressions are comments or actions that subtly and often unconsciously or unintentionally express a prejudiced attitude toward a member of a group traditionally excluded from participating or uninvolved. Al was very sympathetic and he told me he would speak to Mike about his responsibility, uh, making sure that Mike knew that not working with me was not an option. So Al contacted me several days later and said a meeting was um, in order. So Mike and I could speak face to face. Al invited Mike and me to lunch with him and Al acted as a mediator. 
Mike expressed that he did not think that I was qualified to be chairperson. Al told Mike that I would not have been elected chairperson had I not been qualified. Mm -hmm. At the end of the meeting, Mike agreed to give me a try. Give me a try? Huh. Let me tell you, Mike never gave me a try. He tried to gaslight me. Gaslighting is a colloquialism that is loosely defined as uh, making someone question their reality. You know, I went into the chairmanship believing that I was capable, but Mike said, I didn't know what I was doing. And he made decisions that I should have made as chair. At board meetings, he mumbled disparaging remarks about me that other board members heard. They heard the microaggressions, but they didn't recognize them as such because I did not react. Mm -hmm. He threw a paper at me one time instead of handing the paper to me. And, you know, I didn't want to be pegged as an angry Black woman or creating drama. So I did what Michelle Obama said. She said, when they go low, you go high. It didn't work with Mike. The microaggressions continued my whole term. It was a two-year term. Mm -hmm. I completed my term as chairperson three years ago. So this was relatively recently. Yeah. Well, fast forward to today. Mike is currently chairman. I am still on the board and I attend all the board meetings. When I was board chairperson, our section won the newsletter award. And this was a national award. Today, there is no section newsletter. Mike will not ask me to be newsletter editor and I wouldn't agree to be newsletter editor even if he did ask me because Mike doesn't wanna work with me and you editor has to work with everybody. The truth of the matter is that unfettered microaggressions take a toll not only on the victims, but also on organizations. They deprive organizations of human capital and inclusivity. And I do want to acknowledge that Mike is an outlier in this particular organization. I managed to get a lot of things done during my term as chairperson because I worked with other board members uh, to overcome what I call the gross inequity of a secretary treasurer who refused to work with me as chairperson. And I'm grateful that I had Al as an ally. Support also came from the national office. National organizations can espouse diversity and inclusion at the top, but the local culture will not change as long as microaggressions or microaggressors act out their fears that white privilege is threatened by talented members of color who are capable and want to be included in leadership. And also when allies do not step up. On my saddest days as board chair, my happiest days were attending the NDA board meetings where I was included. Jacqueline Onassis defined happiness best as complete use of your faculties along lines leading to excellence and affording them scope. I'll end it there. Thank oh. you, Dr. Hisha, for giving me my say. Oh, no, thank you for sharing. And, and, you know, a lot of these stories that we'll hear from everyone is very courageous to share that. Um, and, and having the vulnerability to do so means a lot that um, a lot of us will say, you know, they're not alone, but you, you exemplify the resilience to see that you have come and you continue to lead and, and lead your members so well. So thank you, Dr. Alston. Dr. Rosa Shaviana Moran. Hello, <laughs> president of the Hispanic Dental Association. Go ahead and unmute yourself and, and we'll go into your question. And by the way, attendees, at the, at, after we go through the one question which e with each president, we'll have an opportunity to um, have the Q&A and actually, and they will have a, another final remark. 
So as Associate Dean uh, for Admissions at Rutgers School of uh, Dental, Me Dentist, Dental Medicine, you are immersed in every step of the admissions process and aware of the racial mix in the applicant pool. So although we have seen an increase in the Hispanic first-time enrollees in the past decade, which is great, the percentage of Hispanic and other underrepresented minority dental student enrollments remains significantly lower than the percentage of, of each group in the United States population. In what ways, if any, do you feel racism serves as a barrier to entry? At RSDM is taking a holistic approach to the admission process. Um, can you explain what that is for some of our other dental institutions here? And, and how is it helping to recruit and retain dental students from diverse backgrounds? Well. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, and, and I just want to thank you, Dr. Hyshaw and ADA, uh, for inviting me uh, to be part of this uh, panel discussion with my amazing colleagues. Um, but yes, racism can definitely have a profound influence in the dental school admissions processes. And therefore, on the final race and ethnic makeup, of the selected incoming class, which will obviously affect the total student body and the institutional environment. We must be aware that racism can be concealed in the institutional makeup. Racial discrimination in the admissions process can occur through subtle forms of differential treatment that are not necessarily obvious or in a public display. Applicants to dental school can experience racism in a variety of ways. In its most overt form, this racial discrimination can occur because admissions committee members, they stereotype the candidates and or the committee members have their own prejudice and biases. Mm -hmm. Stereotyping in the admissions process assumes that if the applicant is from a specific ethnicity, race, underrepresented or marginalized group, they do not have the same academic foundation or ability to navigate through the dental curriculum and therefore will not be successful in dental school. So this racial profiling during the screening and admissions process is of course based in false incomplete information or false generalizations. These assumptions that this applicant won't or can make it are the gatekeepers or the barriers that prevent these qualified applicants to enter dental schools. Mm -hmm. So I have met many admissions committee members that even though they're well-meaning and not overtly biased, can nevertheless stereotype and make assumptions about an applicant. They focus so much on the candidate's ability to be successful in the academic setting that they lose sight of the end goal, which is producing qualified healthcare professionals that, in, that will in turn increase, increase a diverse oral health workforce. Mm -hmm. So, let us focus on the potential the applicant displays for success as a professional. Mm -hmm. Let us move away from those metrics and cognitive factors mm -hmm. and towards the non-cognitive attributes and the skills oral health professionals really need to have. Let us focus on grit. Let us focus on passion that these candidates bring to our tables. That is what constitute holistic admissions. The Association of American Medical College in their publication, Roadmap to Excellence, back in 2013, provided the definition for holistic admissions as a balanced, individualistic review of qualities that is evidence-based and aligned with the mission of the school. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? A true holistic admissions review of a candidate will place a greater emphasis on the non-cognitive factors, such as the personal statement, dental shadowing, community outreach experiences, leadership, and personal attributes. It will place less emphasis on the standardized test scores, like the DATs 
and the grade point averages. Mm -hmm. Holistic review is a flexible, highly individualized process. We have to look through everything in the applicant's file and identify why is this candidate an asset, not only to our institutions, but to our dental profession. And yes, holistic review is labor intensive. It takes a lot of time, but it has to be done. Admissions committee members must be provided with an orientation and procedural admissions guidelines. They must have requirements for training in application screening and interviewing. They must be trained in cultural competence and biases. We must learn to build a common understanding of the desire and the mission-driven outcomes. We want diversity as well as the criteria and processes for achieving those outcomes. We need to value and evaluate each prospective candidate based on their experiences, accomplishments, and the road that they have traveled. A holistic review will also help the committee identify the areas where the institution may need to provide support once these candidates are enrolled. We can't forget that retention is the key. If we yeah. bring them in, they need to be successful. We must support our students, not only academically, but emotionally. We need to provide them with a sense of belonging. In order to retain and support these historically underrepresented students, our dental institutions must highlight the institutional policies our curriculum, practices, and programs that are in place in order to promote and ensure an inclusive and equitable environment. So why is this holistic application review important? Because it opens the door for those that might not be considered for admissions. It's a better educational experience for all of our students. It diversifies the dental workforce and improves access to care. It not only creates institutional excellence, but societal excellence. And I'm gonna leave you with this. In looking for perfect scores, we will miss that ideal candidate. So thank you for this opportunity because this is very, very important. Thank you. Oh, well said. Thank you so much for sharing that. I mean. It is explained why diversity in dentistry is so important. And I, I applaud Rutgers and um, the work that you are doing to make sure that students are seen holistically because that is gonna be the true measure of uh, who will be successful and give back to the community. And happy Hispanic Heritage Month. <laughs> I will invite everyone to, to go onto their social media and to learn a lot that they're sharing there um, during this month of awareness. So let's go on. We are moving on because I know the time is flying too fast. We, we need more time. But Dr. Ferguson Young, president of the American Association of Women Dentists, welcome. Thank you. The future of dentistry is female. <laughs> women make up half of the dental student body and an ADA estimates that women dentists will make up 28% of the workforce. This is great news. Yet there had still been gender bias comments from others stating we won't have the workforce to meet the need of our patients due to women working less. How do you respond to these assumptions? And also, um, as a Black woman in leadership, have you had to overcome racial and gender biases to rise to the top? Well, first of all, I would like to thank you uh, for inviting me to represent AAWD uh, to this panel. It is very much a, a needed conversation that we need to have. I will have to start with my own personal experiences. I am a graduate of Meharry Medical College, class of 1979. Interesting enough, my class was the first largest class of women dental students. Grand total of 12 mm -hmm. out of 47 students. Uh, at our dental school on the third floor, what I will call the Dean's Hall, we have photos of classes dating back to 1950. 
I will say, as far as Mahari is concerned, we have always been diversified. However, we were not always gender diversified. In those 50 and 60 classes, you would see all males. However, they were diverse. So going through dental school with 11 of my fellow gender colleagues, we would hear statements like, you know, as you stated, that there will be a decrease in the workforce because women don't work that hard or they're not going to work that many hours, which makes it sounds like it is a J-O-B instead of a career. Mm -hmm. As if women did not have the aptitude or the energy or the smarts to actually handle a business or to maybe even be a professor in the school or to do anything that they wanted to do under the umbrella. So after graduating, uh, my first position was I was a staff dentist at a local community health center. Practically every month, several um, patients would come in. And again, our patients uh, were from diverse populations as well. Oh, I've never seen a, a woman dentist. Mm -hmm. And I guess in my mind, growing up in the neighborhood I did, I was raised by my grandparents who never told me that it wasn't any, they never said you are limited to what you can think about you're going to do in life. I never had that option. So when I would hear that, it would sort of take me back, like, wow, and my comment used to them was, there's a lot of us out here. I don't know why you haven't met any women dentists. Um, because in my mind, I'm thinking equality, equity. You know, you would find a woman dentist out here somewhere, mm -hmm. or we'd be, we would be mistaken for, oh, are you the nurse? Are you the dental nurse? You know, uh, a miss, miss, can you help me? Or I have a question for the dentist. And then when you turn around or, or you look at them and say, I am the dentist, you know, they seem sort of taken back about that. So fast forward, you know, it's a matter of educating your patients. It's a matter of us being out there with getting our faces out in the public. Um, as I progress more into my act, my academic career. And as any academics here on this panel can tell you, as you are going up the ranks from assistant professor, or maybe you started as instructor to associate professor, all the way to full professor, I would say it is very challenging for women, or it was for my era, because it appears that we always had to provide more. We could not get away with a smaller package. We could not get away with maybe um, half of the information or half of the experiences as you take one step after the other. So I would say in most arenas, that is probably still very challenging to most women dentists. And when we talk about women being the wave of the future, mm -hmm. I also sit on the admissions committee and probably been on there about five years. So in that time frame, I have seen that there has been an increase, more of an increase in women applying to dental school than men. So the challenge is if we'll probably be finding more men to actually become dentists, or, you know, sometimes we say, so what? Are, are they turning to other professions now? Do they feel that this is going to turn into an all woman's uh, career? But dentistry is very fascinating and with all of its 
quirks and, and shortcomings and all of that. Um, but it's very unfortunate that someone like me, who was a child during the civil rights movement, is still seeing the same things mm -hmm. going on in 2021. Someone who experienced racism as a child um, coming from North Carolina, um, when you would go shopping or, or have people follow you because of your race, or people not coming to help you when they are assuming you don't have the money, you can't do this, you can't do that, uh, put, continue to put a mark on you. But I had to go back to racism and I definitely enjoyed uh, the commentaries that were given by the pediatric dentist before we started. I would have to go back to how people are raised, their environment. So just as we know about oral stories and all about cultures, mm -hmm. I think that there is an oral story that is going on that continues to go on because I don't think children are born as racist. Mm -hmm. But I think that their environment leads them to become judgmental of people based on what their parents or their grandparents or their community think. Yeah. Um, and it's really a sad. And I wish I could say, oh, I see a bright light. I see the end of the tunnel. I see a light at the end of the tunnel. I think that this is going to get better. Right. I'm not sure I would see it in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And that is very um, condemning, I think, for the communities of color who really need dentists. Um, as we all know, dentists who look like them, they feel more comfortable, they feel more trust, they feel safe. If this continues. Right. Um, I would also like to put in a statement about state boards. Let's talk about those supposedly uh, blind state boards in uh -huh. which you put your photo, but it's a blind state board. <laughs> Let's talk about the percentage of people of color who actually passed on the first time. If that state board was taken, at a school where, if that was where the, the state board was taken, maybe their students passed. Well, what about outside people who had the same training, who had to take the same national boards? Yeah. What about us being really graded on what we do and not by where we are from? So, uh, in closing, I would say there is much work to be done mm -hmm. and it would take the commitment of all of us to stand strong, mm -hmm. stand and push this conversation further. Um, I do see that maybe, hopefully there is a bright future, mm -hmm. but um, I would say that my dental career has been very rewarding. It also has been very challenging. True, yeah. But I uh, just applaud everyone who is here, who has stood up, did not let any brick walls that you ran into uh, discourage you. Um, so on that note, I will end my my commentary, my oh, comments. My <laughs> well, thank you for sharing your commentary. And you're right, the conversation is going to need to continue. Of course, um, systemic racism and institutional racism wasn't born overnight, nor will we fix it in one webinar, but hopefully we'll uh, spark more, more discussions. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to uh, Dr. Felicia Pono. I'm so sorry. I practiced so hard. Font no. Yeah, no. <laughs> I got it now. Um, from the Society of American Indian Dentists. His work indigently 
uh, towards promoting improving the oral health of American Indian and Alaska Native community. But with such a disproportionate number of AIN, AIN dentists, if I may abbreviate, there is simply not enough providers to treat them, requiring other dentists to provide care. What is the most common misconception or conceptions that people have about your culture or ethnic identity that you would like to address? Can you share incidents where it has affected you professionally? Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for having me on the panel. Um, so to those of you who are attending, you may see me. I, I may be the first Native American dentist that you've ever seen, and I'm getting used to that. There are not that many of us. And um, you probably haven't seen very many representations of Native Americans in just contemporary culture. Like we're not on commercials, we're not in movies. And um, you know that can be problematic uh, when trying to connect to your patients. But I wanna kind of turn that question around. You know, The question assumes that there will never be enough Native American dentists to treat our own people. And I think, I believe we're the best qualified to treat our people. So we need to focus on increasing our numbers. Um, so just to give you a little snapshot of who we are, um, there are 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States and 63 state recognized tribes. So we're a diverse people. And if you do meet other Native Americans, they may not look like me or sound like me. Um, I, I am Mescalero Apache from New Mexico, but um, there's a lot of variations. Um, so, so we are not all the same. And you know, our, I think our issue is how are we going to increase our numbers? I appreciate um, what Dr. Moran has said about, you know, increasing the numbers of students that matriculate into dental schools. And it really starts from a younger age, such as grade school, like letting kids know that this is a career option and, and letting them see people that look like them. So it's been super rewarding for me to come to my own home and to give presentations at the school on the reservation, which is about three miles from the home I grew up in and let these kids know I grew up down the road and I am your doctor and I am your dentist. So just getting out there, but there's a huge weight because our membership is just shy of 100 members and 45 of our said members are students. So not all of us have a DDS or DMD. So it just feels like being that Native American dentist, you get asked to do everything, bring everything to the table, but then also explain yourself to your colleagues and peers. And I recently attended a majority dental meeting at the ADA and in the span of an hour of the meet and greet, I got asked lots of questions that I'm used to being asked as a Native person and I was really surprised that I was asked them by my fellow dentists. Um, you know, we were all dentists. We were all dressed professionally. We all had name badges that said doctor. And someone asked me if I was a hygienist. Someone asked me if I was foreign trained. <laughs> someone asked me if there were teepees on reservations. Um, so it's, you know, and I, I accept those comments because, you know, I know people aren't ill-intentioned or trying to be rude. They're truly curious. And I think, um, you know, for, for those of you dentists who want to come out to Indian Health Service or on the reservation, as long as you are sincere in your heart, um, we welcome you. Um, but it's my experience as a Native person that people who come and serve Native people don't stay. They come and they serve a few years because they're trying to get student loan repay back or just kind of get a new experience. But once the kids and their family um, are grade school age, they're trying to leave so they can have their kids attend school somewhere else. Um, so we really need to train and encourage our own people to serve as dentists. And um, let's see. And I would just like to close with a, just a couple of experiences and like what motivates me to continue, even though, you know, things were not necessarily easy. Like it's sometimes when, when my first job was on a tribal nation that was not of my own tribe and I constantly was mistaken as a dental assistant. And I even had one elderly patient ask not to see me because she wanted to see a white man. And that was very disheartening, but it also um, 
kind of filled me with courage. Like I am entering territory that no one else has entered in before as the first Mescalero Apache dentist. And so people um, aren't used to seeing someone like me, but I'm right. hoping my lifetime that will change. Uh, most recently, I attended uh, my local dental meeting. This was before COVID. And I woke up that morning feeling fabulous, uh, you know, getting ready. I'm, I'm a dentist, I'm living my best life. And here's me going to a dental meeting um, on the lands that belong to the Mescalero Apache people before we were confined to the reservation. And I went to a, a class on treatment of endodontic pain and the presenter gave a racist example. He compared the pulp of a tooth to Custer's last stand and he showed a picture on his slide of Custer being uh, murdered by all the Native Americans and just the context, you know, um, it was terrible. And I was outraged that, you know, someone, a, a colleague, a dental colleague could do something like that. And that's because, you know, people don't see Native Americans as being a, an alive, modern and vibrant people. So I move forward and I'm hoping, you know, to change that. And to you all as my dental colleagues and peers, to, you know, thank you for being here. And, you know, please let's learn more and let's work together because we have shared issues. And thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. No, oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And definitely you are a change maker and visionary that's gonna bring along the next generation of Native American, American Indian dentists um, to, to better serve and be there um, to, to continue to grow and touch their community. So thank you for sharing those comments. Thank Dr. You. David Kim, thank you, thank you. Dr. David Kim, thank you. And I, I will state, I, I apologize. Uh, we just had so much information to share. We will continue if you can stay with us. <clears throat> um, but we do wanna hear from our, our last two presidents. Dr. David Kim, president of the Korean American Dental Association. Thank you for being here. Now, sadly, we've witnessed horrific anti-Asian hate crimes since COVID pandemic, which has brought to light very serious bias, discrimination, stereotypes of Asian Americans in healthcare <clears throat> have definitely felt it. Um, and I, I have read, and I wanted to bring this question to you as being in the, as a, a resident, excuse me, as a uh, faculty in a residency, if, if you're seeing that residents are having a different experience than you did coming up, does this mirror what's happening um, in oral maxillofacial surgery residents at your teaching hospital? And what changes need to be made? And just to share your thoughts on that. Thank you, Dr. Aisha and the members of the Diversity Summit Presidents Group uh, uh, for inviting uh, me and the Korean Dental Association, uh, American Dental, Korean American Dental Association for this uh, important topic. Um, I'd like to just, uh, in interest of uh, time, just, uh, um give just just a couple of examples um first uh, when i was uh, um, um applying to oral surgery in dental school um you know i was told by a very concerned um, professor that was supporting me um basically look um you know i know you guys are smart and all but you're too quiet you know that's just a very stereotypical statement i know he was trying to help me trying to uh, have, have me more engaging and, and be outspoken, but that just kind of shows the uh, the systemic racism that existed. And also uh, in my residency, um, um, I did my residency in Philadelphia. This hospital, you know, was founded in 1850. Um, and 1986, it was the first level one trauma center in, in Philadelphia, you know, level one trauma center. Yeah needs an oral maxillofacial surgery residency and, and, and in-house attendings, calls and whatever. Um, however, when I uh, got accepted in 1998, I was the, the first non-white um, resident to be accepted to the program. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, it, you know, other, other departments had different uh, um, um, race residents, but I was the, the first Asian um, American resident for this program, oral surgery in this hospital. So um, I think there was a lot of pressure on me to, you know, perform uh, and 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 um, kind of represent non-white um, um, uh, minorities because you know oral surgery was is 
uh, was very uh, much a, a white male uh, specialty. And, uh, it's not as bad now, you know, I, have, I see residents of all different colors and gender. Mm -hmm. um, but when I uh, was there, um, some of the patients, trauma patients would say, I don't want to be treated by that Chinese doctor, you know? So, and, and, and the uh, emergency medicine doctor would say, um, David, if you don't feel comfortable treating this patient, you don't have to. And, and one of my program director, I really have to give it to him. He came up to the patient and said, look, there is no Chinese doctor here. Dr. Kim is American. I'm American. We are all American. Mm -hmm. And he's the best one qualified to do this job. So I really uh, um, appreciate, you know, my program director standing up for that and, and basically taking the race out of the uh, um, issue as an issue. Mm -hmm. um, so nowadays, you know, I see in younger uh, residents much more um, uh, collaborative efforts and and less stereotypical uh, um, instances, uh, and I see more, um, you know, diverse uh, um, sexuality and, and race uh, represented in, in the uh, uh, OMS residency. So I think we've come a long way in about, you know, 23, 24 years that, you know, since I started. Um, but I think this all stems from, you know, including the, uh, the, the, um, the shootings that happened in August in the Atlanta area mm -hmm. of, of this uh, um, Asians uh, stereotypes uh, having that we're quiet, you know, that we're more submissive. And I think this stems from 1960s when, you know, we're kind of termed model minorities. You know, this is, is, is an effort by basically, uh, um, you know, white um, community to um, create a racial, uh, you know, minority that's kind of model citizens that look at these groups, they're minority that, you know, but they work hard and they're quiet, they don't complain, they're quiet. And, and, and you know, that kind of extends the racism, you know, it, it just makes it worse. So it just downplays the, the, the racism and, and inequality of American society. And I think that kind of manifested uh, with, with the shooting. Um, and there are a lot of other instances where um, our members, Korean American dentists, especially women, are looked at by certain patients as, as a sexually submissive or exotic figure instead of a doctor dentist. You know, and, and that's, that's, that's uh, something that we all have to work with and, and work on um, to get rid of the stereotypes and to um, basically, I wanted to echo what Dr. Martin Luther King said in his I Have a Dream speech is that we have to be judged by our character, not by skin of our color. And I, you know, I think uh, when I say that I represent all the the members of Korean American Dental Association, as well as other Asian um, minority groups, that we're forever gonna look like we're not, we don't belong in America because of the fact that, you know, um, Asians always kind of seem more exotic and different. Mm -hmm. So we got to work together to get rid of the, the race as, as an issue. And I really appreciated Dr. Howard's talk, and he said, you know, race is created, racism is created and, and race is a child of racism. Yeah. I, I really appreciate that, that statement. And I think we could work together to get rid of the racism in our country. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And we would love to continue to walk this walk together. It's gonna to take that. And, and too many residents and students have, have heard that. Um, uh, and I, I love how you shared how your program director stood up for you. We need more upstanders, not bystanders. It's not okay. It's not okay to be quiet. So right. just, just be complicit. And again, like what, what I was faced to is um, to hear the voices of NDA and ADA stand up to say it, it is not okay. So thank you so much, Dr. Kim. Thank you. Great work. Dr. Cesar Sabatez, congratulations. You're president-elect of the American Dental Association. And you acknowledge that 
And we're so happy about that too, to, to continue to have an advocate for diversity. Uh, you've acknowledged that some of the ADA members feel their voices are not being heard and you want to be the leader to listen and provide resources for all ADA members to succeed. I hope our dialogue today will assist you in addressing the concerns brought up today. Um, the ADA's 2020-2025 um, Diversity and Inclusion Plan presents a framework for elevating DNI efforts to address um, and improve the representation in our uh, dental workforce, our membership, and at the leadership level. How will you use your platform to influence, influence other leaders and members to embrace and fight with you for the betterment of our profession? First of all, thank you, Dr. Heisler, for putting this all together. And I want to thank all the panelists. You know, I have learned a great deal uh, from this webinar. And I am extremely proud that I will be in uh, around 31 days, but who's counting, will be the 58th, uh, 158th president of the American Dental Association, but the first Cuban-American uh, president of the American Dental Association. And I'm extremely proud. One of the things that... Uh, since I've been involved in leadership that I, that I subscribe to is that, uh, and it was a Walt Disney who said this, he says that the things that unite us far outweigh and outnumber those that unite us. And I truly believe that. I truly believe each of us, we're all unique, but we're all part of a dental family. And that's what unite, unites us. And I'm hoping to help continue moving forward the efforts of diversity and inclusion of the ADA and make every member, make every dentist feel wanted, feel respected, feel loved, and be and feel a part of our organization. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm personally going to try to do. And if you could help me, I would uh, tremendously appreciate that. We do need to get uh, more dentists out there into the communities, uh, especially dentists of, of color. The HBI data shows that we haven't moved the needle in that at all in the last, uh, I don't know, 20 years. We have a slight increase in, in Asians. We have a slight increase in Hispanics, but the uh, black uh, dentists have not increased. And so we have to consciously work on that. And so I'm here to help uh, facilitate whatever you need. I will continue to work with the diversity presidents group. I'm very honored by uh, being here with you tonight. And I know the time is running short but I, I plan to move um, this labor of love forward. And I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Heishaw, for, for bringing this to us. And I hope that we, this will be one of many webinars in the future to bring light to this uh, very important issue. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, it, it, it time did fly. Oh. Um, so we really don't want to stay over too much longer. I just will, um, let's go ahead and just share the slides so we can explain just a few things on housekeeping and getting your CEs. And I did just want to end um, just quickly here. I think we're going to also be able to email um, our slides because I want to say we've had a lot of information. What's now? What's next? Oh, sorry, I can go back really quick. And um, and you can go on to the four. The, the four things that we're gonna highlight, of course, or the heart of diversity, I really feel, as you've heard from many of the presidents, is mentorship. Um, so look at your, your organization to see how you can serve as a mentor. And my organization, Diversity and Dentistry, we are looking for mentors for the movement. Um, so please, I invite you to come to our website. You can get involved in Diverse Dental Society and they had a excellent programming last summer, um, whereas a combined uh, collaborative between the HDA, NDA, and SAID. Um, and then, and we can go ahead and advance the slides, along with ADEA and the US Department of Oral Health. Um, there's resources there to work on cultural competency. Here's a flyer, a little plug <laughs> for our first inaugural um, Youth Summit, Diversity, Diversified Dentistry Youth Summit at Spear. Um, we are looking again, yes, for mentors. We are looking for donors. Um, we are trying to light the path uh, to dentistry for, for deserving students who may not otherwise consider it as a possibility. And going forward really quickly, um, I get uh, the Diverse Dental Society. There's their website. Please go on to diversedentalsociety.org to learn more about um, their nonprofit organization. 
And then moving on to the next one, Adia has uh, key initiatives and a diversity tool, oh, that's to kick the toolkit available at Adia, and also the oral health um, program for cultural competency is a free program. I've done it, it's fantastic. You should definitely check that out. And then I think, oh, well, we also have a reading brief on some articles that were cited, but also some that some of the past panelists and we've had the discussion shared articles and the following way, following slide shows some books um, of recommendations if you want to, no, no matter where you are in the journey of understanding cultural, get, being proficient in cultural competency, um, understanding and learning and recognizing your biases and how to make different decisions. Um, this, this is a great list to go forward to look at. And so I think that is it. I want to thank you so much. Uh, we have heard a lot, um, a lot that we can think of, these concepts, these nuances, the context, so that when we're faced with certain discussions or decisions, we can look back to these discussions that we had today. And as Maya Angela said, when we know better, we do better. And we know better now. And we can continue to work towards that and hold each other accountable um, because we're only going to better ourselves, our community, and the patients we serve. So I ask you today, what will you do differently? How will you be an upstander for your colleague? How will you address your patients of color so that they feel included and um, and and really feel like you have compassion and empathy for them? How will you speak to a student or a resident to nurture them, nurture them and not belittle them? And finally, how will you plant the seed of hope into our future generation of diverse dentists? I know we can do it together and we all have the passion and compassion to, because we are in the helping field as dentists. So this together, we can only be better as we work together. So thank you so much. We will work and dismantle systemic racism because we were doing it for our beloved profession of dentistry. I thank you very much, all of you, to my esteemed panelists. Thank you for joining us this evening. I thank you for our, our attendees for having the courage to listen and uh, to hear uh, and see the vulnerability and of our panelists and our presenters to share their stories. I hope you learn from them. You will be receiving your CE credit for attending this webinar. It takes three to five business days after you uh, get an assessment. Uh, I believe it's five questions that will be emailed to you. So make sure to look at the email that you registered with for this webinar. Thank you again so much and good night. <laughs>